When I think of someone doing research in astronomy, it goes something like this. A person is looking at a tiny section of the night sky through a large, very powerful telescope, and they take a photograph of what they see. The picture is a lot of white dots, some sharp points, some more fuzzy blobs. The next night, the astronomer takes another photograph of the exact same section of the sky at the exact same time, and so on for a month, maybe two, maybe an entire year, night after night. And the astronomer compares the pictures of the little white dots and notices something peculiar going on with one of them. They publish this result, others verify it, and the world realizes that a great discovery has been made. That is looking out. Molecular biology looks in, microscopically, into the world of atoms and genes, but what they see is really not all that different from what the astronomer sees. They see a fuzzy dot, and from it they harvest a new discovery. Francis Crick defined molecular biology as a way of observing the borderline between the living and the non-living. A single human thumb tip consists of a trillion million atoms. The thumb is alive, the atoms are not. Go investigate that. Molecular biology begins with the work of the monk, Gregor Mendel, on his pea plants. He bred them for differences in the color of the flowers, for tall and short plants, for smooth and wrinkled peas. Then he crossbred them and discovered, in effect, dominant and recessive characteristics. What he really discovered was that there was something there to be discovered. When his work and its results were re-established in 1900, the science really begins. It reaches a peak in 1953 when James Watson and the aforementioned Francis Crick discover, with the help of Rosalind Franklin, the double helical structure of DNA. That is important because the function of the molecule lies in its structure, and once that fabulous structure was known, all kinds of barely realized things began to make enormous sense. As a pole on the earth, the race to discovery was on. As to a pole on the earth, the race to discovery was on. The biologists do their work in very unexciting places, working with mice and worms and, most of all, fruit flies, Drosophila, lover of the morning dew. They work, the work they do is intensely demanding, slow to unfold, and fantastically tedious. The work these people do makes the average nerd seem like a wild-eyed, spaced-out, naked party grower. Thomas Morgan started the fly room, and Seymour Benzer devoted his life to them, and they had students, postdocs, who pushed the research to incredible lengths and conclusions, and now there are fly rooms around the country and around the world. The work they have done with Drosophila is so astonishing that it's almost unbelievable. Who would think you could extract such information about nature as a map of the human genome from working with a fruit fly? I just read a pretty wonderful book about this, Heredity, the Genetic Code, Nature and Nurture, and that map of the human genome, which would fill 134 sets of the Encyclopedia Britannica, and which is about the same as the mouse genome. If you chop mouse genome into 200 pieces and put them together rearranged, you would have human chromosomes. And that genome is comparable to fish, plants, ants, fungi, and bacteria. The human code is an offshoot of the code for life. These scientists were not only looking, like Mendel, for the genetic basis for physical representation, phenotypes, they were also looking for the basis for certain behaviors, many of which their esteemed colleagues thought was absurd, impossible, or just plain wrong. Yet they succeeded in isolating and mapping genes for a sense of time, a clock, for mating behavior, and for memory. Following these stunning accomplishments, the media jumped on the bandwagon and trumpeted the discovery of 
genes for violence, reading disabilities, manic depression, psychosis, alcoholism, autism, drug addiction, gambling, ADD, PTSD, Tourette's syndrome, and the famous gay gene. Genetic engineering, that seemed to say, would create the perfect creature. Of course, it's not that simple. If they do produce behavior, as well as blue eyes, genes appear to act in extremely complicated sequences to elicit these effects. We're not looking at notes. We're looking at symphonies. Two things. One is an experiment by a French astronomer in 1720 with a plant, the heliotrope. It unfurls its leaves in the morning and closes them up at night. He put the plant in a pitch-dark room. It kept time. And there was the man who built a recording studio two centimeters long, one centimeter wide, a third of a centimeter high, with a microphone two millimeters below the floor. And he made tapes of the wing beats of fruit flies, courting behavior, love songs. He transcribed them into long graphs of pen scratchings and got insightful information out of this. Or consider breeding generations of mutant flies, freezing them and slicing their brains into sections thousands of times and looking for differences. Think about that. The discoveries these scientists made are not the only thing that's amazing. What's most amazing to me is what we will do to find out something, which is anything. We will do anything if we think it will provide us with the merest scrap of information about who and what we are.